So, yeah, so I'm Sagat and I'm a postdoc at Leiden Observatory. Uh, and I'll be talking about uh, Mu's Cube surveys. And first of all, I'd like to thank Pratik and Viman for uh, giving me this opportunity to tell us about sur our surveys in this exciting meeting. And uh, I must say, this stage is all set for CGM talk, uh, thanks to excellent talk by uh, Jessica and Nicola. Uh, so I should just uh, say what we did. And uh, so it's mu cubes, and it stands for the mu Quasar Field Blind Emitter Surveys. And now that uh, we know what Thakam Galactic Medium is and why they're uh, I don't see it's going anywhere. It doesn't work. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So that's the Muse Cube collaboration. Uh, the uh, member of the uh, uh, team is Sean Johnson from Princeton. Me, myself, Yoke is the PI for both the CGM surveys that I'm going to talk, and Mike Sehers, Lori Straka from Leiden, and Martin Wen from AI uh, AIP Postem, and plus the uh, full Muse consortium, so it's a part of Muse GTO uh, uh, program. And the outline of my talk will be: I'll give you a very brief overview of uh, Muse, and then I'll uh, describe the survey design and preliminary results of uh, two surveys. One I call it Muse Cubes. One is the Sakam Galactic Medium of low redshift galaxies, and low redshift meaning is uh, redshift less than one. And MuSkips 2, uh, where we study the circum galactic medium of high redshift galaxies. And when I say high redshift galaxies, they are uh, identified by the, by the Lyman alpha emission. So that's the Lyman alpha emitter. So, so MUSE is multi unit spectroscopic explorer. Uh, Nicola already uh, told us about MUSE and its uh, power. And it's a second generation instrument installed on uh, VLT UT4. It's a, uh, it's, uh, this instrument uh, was built in collaboration with uh, this seven uh, institute, European institute, including uh, Leiden, uh, which comes under NOVA. So it's an integral field spectrograph uh, with the largest field of view. It's one by one arc minute in the wide field mode. And it has 24 subfields, and each of those subfields actually fed into an integral field unit. And it has a continuous spatial sampling of 0.2 cross 0.2 arc seconds. And that means, in a given uh, Muse cubes, you will have 90,000 spectra, and that's tremendous. And that's the power of Muse. And it has a spectral coverage from 4,750 to 9,350 angstrom with a resolution. Uh, uh, of 3000. So we got the G2 team got uh, 250 nights of uh, observation, uh, like new time to pursue various uh, uh, like uh, astronomical problems. So Muse Cubes 1, that's the low Z Satam Galactic Medium study. So in which we have 16 quasar field. And uh, what do I mean by that? So there is a quasar at the center of the mu cubes. These mu cubes have depth of two to ten hours, and in totally uh, for the sixteen fields, we have used sixty-five hours of mu mu GTO time. And mu passband is such that you can uh, probe H alpha emission from redshift zero to redshift point four, O three from uh, redshift zero to redshift point nine, O two from zero to uh, sorry, 0.3 to 1.5 and so on. So these are the main uh, emission line diagnostics we used for our emission line, as, uh, like finding galaxies. And so at the center, well, uh, as I said, like there is a quasar, and for those quasars, we have medium resolution uh, HST cost spectra. And the emission redshift of the, those quasars are ranging from 0.4 to 1.5. And the medium resolution cost spectra has a resolution of 20,000 and signal to noise ratio of 10 to 40 per resolution element. So we have targeted these absorption lines from the um, galaxies uh, in the, uh, we detected in the mu cube, so H1, O6, silicon 3, carbon 3, and nitrogen 5. So, so far we have detected 300 uh, galaxies, roughly 300 galaxies, 
uh, that are detected at redshift less than the quasar redshift. Mm, they are all continuum selected so far and uh, using source extractor. And there are 50, about 50 more galaxies that are pure line emitters. So uh, you don't see them in continuum, but you, you see them in emission lines such as O2, O3 emission lines. And I think it's the largest and largest uniform sample with uh, impact parameter less than 300 kiloparsecs. And not only that, we have initially the data uh, from HSC, ACS for all the uh, fields. That means we will have uh, good quality imaging of those fields, which will give us uh, galaxy morphology and uh, kinematics. And we have for some of those uh, quasars, DNT UBIT uh, spectra, uh, which actually gives us uh, factor three uh, better resolution than HSC cos, and, and those spectra will cover uh, important uh, lines such as magnesium two, uh, sodium one, calcium two, and so on. And for some of these uh, 16 fields, we also have IMAX and LDSS uh, three multi object uh, spectroscopy. Uh, so, which has like larger field of view, but again, uh, you, you have to do pre selection. So, you need to know where the galaxy is to sleep, but anyway, we, we have more galaxies in those fields. Okay. So, I think that's the uh, uh, image uh, or uh, the figure that uh, actually demonstrates what I was trying to uh, tell you. So, that's the quasar, uh, that's the muse field centered around quasar AG0153 and the quasar has emission redshift of 0.45 and we have detected a galaxy over here you see in the star uh, so that's the white light image of that galaxy and that's here's the HSC image of that same galaxy the galaxy is detected at a uh, projected uh, separation of 102 kiloparsecs and the redshift of the galaxy is uniquely fixed by the O3 and H alpha emission lines to be at uh, 0 0.2252. And when we go to cos spectra at the corresponding wavelengths, um, we see all like all sorts of transitions, like from very strong Lyman alpha to all the way up to Lyman 930, angstrom O1, C2, uh, SI2. And you see that we also have UV spectra for that and you can clearly see multi-component magnesium 2 absorption. Uh, and since it has a better resolution, uh, it, it, you can clearly see the component structure, which is barely seen in the medium resolution cross spectra. So it, it actually demonstrates the power of high resolution spectroscopy. And you can also see very strong O6 absorption from uh, the halo of that galaxy. So now, uh, we have in total 318 galaxies uh, in those 16 fields. As I said before, they are all continuum selected and pure line emitters are not used in this talk, uh, but we will be using them uh, in future. So the impact parameter of those uh, galaxies ranges from 10 to 320 kiloparsecs with a median impact parameter of uh, 150 kiloparsecs. And uh, we also did out their real radius. I'll, I'll go to that, how we did that. And medium rho by RVL is roughly 1.78. Yeah. So then, what we did, we we derive stellar mass from uh, SED fitting using the uh, code uh, part by this reference, and then uh, using that stellar mass, we use the abundance melting relationship uh, given by most sure to get the virial mass and from that we calculated R200 which is called r virial. and the SFR of these galaxies so if you see this here uh, in this plot so j, uh, x axis is the emission redshift of the galaxies so you, if you see we detect galaxies from redshift 0 to all the way up to redshift point uh, 9 and you see that's the range in stellar mass. So it's a lot larger range than uh, like fossil uh, this morning we, we uh, heard from Jessica. And it has like 10 to 6 to uh, 10 to 11 in solar mass. And we cal uh, estimated SFR for either from H alpha or from O2 lines. And SFR is uh, ranging from minus 2 or you have to 10 solar mass per year. And here you can see the median properties of our galaxies. Mm. So medium stellar mass is uh, roughly 10 to 9 solar mass. 
and they are, uh, I, I must emphasize, as uh, Nicola also did, uh, that we are actually probing low mass galaxies uh, in these mu cubes. And the median virial uh, mass of uh, our sample is 10 to roughly 10 to 11 solar mass, and median uh, virial radius 86 kiloparsecs. The median SFR is 0.2 solar mass per year, so they are forming stars uh, only at a mild rate. And median SSFR, specific star formation rate of 10 to minus 9.6 per year. So they are predominantly star forming. And luminosity of these galaxies, median is 0.1 uh, elster. So uh, these galaxies are predominantly star elster galaxies. So now let's go to some results. So I I'll caution uh, that these are preliminary results and every day we are updating it. So. Uh, so that's an x-axis is the normalized impact parameters, is the impact parameter divided by the uh, virial radius of the galaxy, and y-axis is the covering fraction of O6, and uh, I know uh, most of you know what covering fraction is, is the uh, number of times you see uh, O6 absorption with uh, the threshold column density we use 13.5, and it seems in the innermost pin, uh, you, you, we have uh, covering fraction of O6 as high as uh, roughly 60 percent and if you like go to all the way up to R virial then the covering fraction is uh, roughly 45 percent if you go to 2 R virial then it drops down to uh, 30 percent uh, uh, for our sample. Then now that we, we know the redshift of uh, 300 galaxies, we can always go and stack the uh, uh, quasar spectrum to get the uh, like mean or median signal or uh, OSIC signal uh, from those galaxies. So that's what is shown in this plot. So x-axis is the line of sight velocity and y-axis is the median uh, optical depth and logarithm uh, scale uh, for O6. That's our favorite transition. So we could do for any other transitions. Uh, but we, we did it for uh, OSIC for the time being and that's the random expectations. So you can clearly see oxygen 6 signal uh, like OSIC signal is enhanced within uh, 100 kilometers per second along the line of sight which gives a characteristic, characteristic velocity of this uh, 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 OSIC absorption is roughly 200 kilometers per second uh, and which is consistent with the uh, circular velocity of those uh, galaxies in our sample. Now, on the right hand panel it's the same but x-axis is the transverse direction so it's not along the line of sight but uh, in the transverse direction so and you can see oxygen 6 is significant the signal is enhanced uh, compared to the uh, random expectation uh, all you have to two virial radius so O6 is wide, widespread all the out to two virial radius and it has a characteristic velocity uh, of 200 kilometers per second yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh, excellent observation. It's the, uh, the other doublet of the O6, 1037. So now that we have a large enough sample, we can make different subsamples based on the star formation rate, stellar mass, and specific star formation rate, and try to see whether we, uh, there is any trend with uh, median uh, O6 signal and the uh, galaxy property. And that's what is done here. So these red points, these are the uh, SFR between uh, uh, like less than 0.1 and the yellow points between 0.1 to 1 uh, solar mass per year and the blue points is uh, above uh, 1 solar mass per year. So it seems like there is a trend uh, with increasing uh, SFR, you see more and more O6 absorption within uh, like 100 kilometers per second. So uh, now uh, I would like to remind you that uh, SFR is also connected with the stellar mass uh, through the uh, star formation main sequence. So we wanted to uh, investigate whether this trend that we see here with uh, star formation is whether it's actually driven by star formation rate or it's actually driven by uh, stellar mass. So what we did, I know it's a busy plot, but uh, for the timing, you just concentrate in this uh, plot, uh, this panel. So uh, all the points are the um, galaxies in our sample uh, in the x-axis is stellar mass and y-axis is the star formation rate and here are the division of those three uh, like uh, SFR uh, uh, bins. So what we did uh, for each stellar mass that uh, we match in two like uh, SFR bins L like uh, we, we find a pair of galaxies with very different uh, SFR. 
So one is falling here, another is falling here. So we, we match this way. Uh, so basically, that's how we created two subsamples uh, for which the star formation uh, rate distribution is very different, but they have the same stellar mass distribution, right? So now you see the oxygen six, uh, oxygen six signal from uh, them, like it's red is red, yellow is yellow. Then it, it seems like there is no uh, like a significantly uh, uh, significant difference between them. And we, in this panel, we did the same again. We match in uh, like stellar mass uh, to have two uh, like pair of points with uh, very different star formation rate, but same uh, stellar mass. So. Again, we see that there is no uh, basically uh, a significant difference between uh, uh, the yellow and the blue points. So it seems like the uh, the trend we seen in this panel with SFR may be driven by the star formation. Uh, sorry, the stellar mass because when we match stellar mass, we don't see any difference in four six signal. And so now, what we uh, what I show here is again now uh, we try to see the dependence on uh, M star and it's again the same plot basically but uh, now for three different mass bins it's 0.6 to 8.5, 8.5 to 9.5 and 9.5 to 11.5 uh, roughly and it seems uh, it, there is a trend between uh, like with mass uh, so that as long as mass is uh, uh, less than 8.5 uh, you see a uh, a drop in the O6 signal, but as long as your mass is greater than uh, 10 to 8.5, we do, uh, don't seem to see any difference in uh, CGM O6 signal. Yes, like in terms of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I, I, I think yeah. So that's the red, red bin maybe. We're we're generally offset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Higher. Yeah. I mean that. Yeah. So I mean it would be higher. I think. So yeah. I think you still uh, you have. So what's the range you use? Nine point five to eleven point five. Is yeah, that, the median is 10 to the 10.5. Yeah, so 10 to the 10.5. So uh, the median, median of our this sample is uh, 10 to 10. So okay. it is still lower. Yeah. yeah. So then we, we play the same trick to try to see whether it is the uh, dependence we see on uh, stellar mass is uh, because of uh, star formation or not. So again, we divided the uh, full sample into three uh, stellar mass beams and then we match it pair. Like for such that uh, for each SFR, uh, so there are two points with very different, uh, there are two galaxies with very different uh, stellar mass. So basically, now you have uh, two subsamples for which the SFR distribution is the same, but the stellar mass distribution is uh, uh, hugely different. And you can see that, uh, you can clearly see this uh, distinction, right, in O6. Uh, signal uh, so that this low mass beam is showing lower O6 uh, uh, signal uh, compared to the higher mass beams. But when we go to uh, this medium mass and high mass, we don't seem to see uh, a significant difference in O6 signal between them. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Uh, yeah. yeah, but uh, but but uh, yeah, we we take all the impact parameters and uh, did uh, the yeah. So I I I have five minutes. Okay. So uh, now dependence on uh, uh, specific star formation rate. Uh, so. Now we uh, use the standard curves of uh, 10 to minus 11 uh, with red points less than 10 to 11 uh, per year and blue points greater than 10 to minus 11 per year. I can see a clear distinction between uh, O6 signal uh, of uh, different specific star formation. It's such that 
like you see more signal for uh, active galaxies or star forming galaxies and less signal for uh, the passive galaxies but you also see that there is a reversal as you go to higher uh, like uh, line of sight velocities so we think that it could be because of two things that uh, high lower SSFR subsamples are uh, suppose, uh, it's presumably more massive so you uh, the circular velocity will be higher for those subsamples and we uh, and they are living in a over galaxy over dense region in uh, such that we may uh, seeing the two hello term or the uh, basically the contribution from the group environment so okay uh, so now i'm <laughs> switching gears to uh, this mu cube 2 it's again the same uh, philosophy but instead of looking for o2 o3 emitters as we did for low z uh, survey now we look for lyman alpha emitters uh, at redshift uh, greater than 2.5 and uh, uh, we have eight mu uh, fields uh, and again, the, uh, at the center, there is a, a UV bright quasar, and we have very high quality uh, quasar spectra for all those eight, eight quasars with resolution 45,000 and signal to noise ratio of 70 to 100 per pixel, and our targeted absorptions are, are this. So, uh, this is the optical, uh, optimal uh, redshift range uh, uh, for studying this kind of um, systems because the Lyman alpha force is still not too severe. and we are looking for Lyman alpha emitters in, in the redshift range of uh, 2.9 to 3.8 and Lyman alpha falls in this redshift range which is free from uh, strong uh, skylines and also the C4 absorption falls in this range which, uh, which is still not severely affected by skylines. So that's the example again at the center that's the Quasar QB2000 and that's the beautiful uh, US data of that, that Quasar we see two Lyman alpha emitters here. You see narrow band image of the Lyman alpha emitters, and there's a beautiful double peak Lyman alpha emission from this. And you might wondering why we don't see anything here because they are uh, like faint and uh, low mass galaxies. So we don't see them in continuum, but we do see them in uh, like narrow band image and line emission. When we see in the uh, US spectrum this weak carbon four and strong H1, and uh, same for this. Uh, other Lyman alpha emitters. So, so far we have identified 75 Lyman alpha emitters. Uh, we, we are using the uh, code uh, by, developed by Sebastian of Antelipo called Cubex, and it's the first ever systematic survey of a circumgalactic medium of Lyman alpha emitters. So, that's the scatter plot in x axis is the redshift, median redshift of our sample is redshift 3.5. Uh, 3.3, .3, I suppose, yeah. And the median impact parameter is roughly uh, 160 kiloparsecs. And so that's the uh, uh, beautiful narrowband images of some of the Lyman alpha emitters in our sample. And that's the preliminary results. So we, we again stack the carbon 4. So you see the uh, beautiful carbon 4 absorption uh, fr uh, coming from the, the uh, actually, that's the mean stack spectrum of C4. Uh, coming from those 75 galaxies and one thing you immediately spot that the absorption is not centered around zero kilometers per second so it's offset uh, with like by blue shifted by 200 kilometers per second and that's the uh, that that's what you expected because lima alpha shows this weird uh, radiative transfer effects and uh, people who are in this business like lima alpha emitters uh, they have been trying to like estimate uh, like what is the shift uh, Lyman alpha emitters, uh, uh, any Lyman alpha emitters uh, give uh, when you uh, determine your know, redshift from Lyman alpha emission and uh, or nebula optical emission lines. So, our this CGM study actually gives an alternate means to calibrate the Lyman alpha redshift in a statistical sense. So, we propose and we uh, for KMOS time and we will propose in future for JWST time for rest frame optical nebula lines such that uh, we can calibrate the uh, offset uh, since lamina alpha emission don't give the true systemic relative and I think uh, with that I will stop and here are my summaries. So first of all uh, we must realize that we have two unique samples and by far the larger samples to study circumgalactic uh, galactic medium in both galaxy-centric and absorption-centric approach. 
So uh, we did look for any galaxies or we did look for any absorption in particular. So this uh, set of data, this data set actually uh, give, uh, allow you to be blind for galaxies once and you can be blind for absorption once. So that's very uh, unique data set uh, which offers this uh, museum survey and covering fraction of O6 around low Z star forming galaxies is 45% within R virial and it goes down to 30% within 2 R virial. The velocity over which O6 signal is detected along the line of sight is 200 kilometers per second which is roughly consistent with the circular velocity of these galaxies in our sample. And O6 absor absorption shows a positive correlation with uh, star formation rate which is actually driven by stellar mass and O6 signal is significantly different for galaxies with uh, stellar mass less than 8.5 and greater than 8.5 and O6 signal is significantly different for galaxies with a specific star formation rate greater than and uh, less than 10 to minus 11 by year and for mu cube 2 uh, the Lyman altimeters in our sample show an average velocity offset of 200 kilometers per second. So, more to come. Stay tuned. Thank you. So, uh, we heard that O6 signal differs by star formation rate in the morning. Now, we are saying that not really stellar mass and maybe specific star formation. And if I remember from Ben Open from his picture, he said, oh, never mind any of those. It's really the halo mass. So, Still, this is related to the exactly. So, what have I going to think is the real driving parameter? Is it really the mass and everything else is secondary? So, or what? SFO has this issue of uh, time delay, as uh, Nicole was mentioning in this talk. So, we've seen this delay, but it has to receive, like, material has to go all the way up to the mass. That takes time. And if you see, Presence day star formation rate and those six absorption. It's actually difficult to interpret. Instead, if you invoke uh, the idea that uh, your halo mass is such that the medium temperature is suitable for the O6 because it's a collision of this equilibrium, it picks around uh, 5.5. <laughs> so, uh, such that you have the right temperature for O6, and that's why O6 is abundant. And in fact, that's what Oppenheimer said in 2016 with O6. It's it's given by um, still mass and open And Oppenheimer can reproduce the class halos results that way because primarily our red galaxies and the class halo sample tend to be the more massive ones. So yeah. I mean it, it's it's a fine way to think about it. Yeah, and, and, and okay. Uh, so, so uh, that actually assumes that all the O6 the O6 and low low Z movements are collisionally ionized. Which I have a problem with. I don't believe that's true. So I think it's both. So it's not. Yeah, but uh, I think the uh, hell mass or stellar mass uh, explanation is appealing. So I'm trying hard to reconcile your last two uh, conclusions on Institute One. They say, no, the, the, the first part. They, it, there is a dichotomy with stellar mass and SSFI. Which seems mutually explicit to me. Um, can you comment on those? Uh, uh, like you say, there is no dependence on star formation because of stellar mass. Yeah. But then you normalize with stellar mass, you get SSFI, yeah, and yeah, you show I, there is I, a dependence. Why? See, is that? I, I also see. I, I, I also say that it depends on stellar mass. Yeah, exactly. How? I mean, I'm kind of so struggling the, to reconcile. It's the SSFI line stellar mass. So if you see some dependence on stellar mass, you also no, see you take out stellar mass. That's why you have SSFI. No, SFR is uh, uh, like SSFR is SFR by stellar mass. Right? So if there is any correlation, it should also be in the SSFR. If it's non-linear, if it's non-linear, uh, non you, you take out one power. It's linear. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's linear. Sleep. Yeah. 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 Ah, uh, okay. So that that I don't, don't have any uh, quantitative uh, quantitative information. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we use cube seems awesome. 
very excited about you know all the other results. I wonder, just from a survey perspective, what uh, fraction of the galaxies in the Muse Cubes field can you not get redshifts for? Like have no features or you can't see them? Uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I don't remember that number, but uh, I can uh, write it to you. It's okay, yeah. I'm, I'm just interested, like, yeah, yeah. from the perspective of somebody who But it's, it's not that uh, uh, we, we, we don't receive all of the No, sure. Of course, there's always a fail rate. Right? I mean, not just the recording. Okay. I would still have a positive now. Yeah. It's a great first talk. Thanks for that.